Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, we're going to broach a difficult topic, the treatment of autism. My guest is Emily Santagati, Chief Clinical Officer of the ABA Centers of America. Emily is going to tell us what ABA therapy is and how it can help children with autism. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, locumstory.com. If you're considering locum tenens, either full-time or on the side, you probably have a question or two, or 20. Fortunately, locumstory.com has the answers you need. It's packed with unbiased information and advice from physicians like you. Locumstory.com has nothing to sell. It's simply a resource for information. You'll find super handy tools that let you see locums trends for your specialty, compare different locums agencies, and there's even a quiz to help you decide if locums is right for you. Locumstory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about locums. And now I'd like to welcome my guest, Emily Santagati. Emily, welcome to the Art of Medicine. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for your time and sharing your expertise. So to begin, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, your training, and how you got involved in the treatment of autism. Sure, absolutely. So for the last 10 years, I've been working with with individuals with autism um, and other developmental disabilities. I actually found I really loved working with people with disabilities uh, when I was in high school. And what I really loved was the perspective that they brought, um, just a differing perspective on the way that they see the world. Um, people with autism see the world in a different way. And it was really valuable to me, that diversity in, in perspective. Um, so I really enjoyed working with individuals with autism um, from high school. And so as I went into college, I thought I wanted to go into special education. Um, I really don't quite like curriculum. <laughs> so what I what I really loved looking at was behavior. I found uh, that I was very compassionate, had a lot of compassion um, for the individuals who were engaging in challenging behavior and um, like, you know, aggression or self-injury, things like that. And so that brought me into the field of behavior analysis. And so my credentials, I am a board certified behavior analyst. Um, I have my master's degree in education with an emphasis on ABA. And um, I also have some state licenses in multiple states as well. All right. So tell us what is ABA therapy? Sure. Um, so ABA actually has its roots in behaviorism. And so um, if you go all the way back to 1913, um, John B. Watson talked about how psychology as a field really wasn't as scientific, didn't have that scientific vigor um, as the, the rest of the hard sciences, like biology and psychology. We did a lot of, well, it's, they made progress with their depression because of introspection, or they were able to change their behavior because of their unconscious things that we couldn't see, things that we couldn't measure. And so he really had this call to action that we need to be able to see things in order to change behavior. Um, and so that is where we came from all the way back in 1913. B.F. Skinner um, did a lot more than just hang out with rats and pigeons. Um, he did a lot with humans as well. And so he provided a framework, which is radical behaviorism, um, and so I say all of that to say it's not this one thing, you know, this one type of methodology. It's actually a collection of methodologies that we utilize um, that falls under the umbrella of ABA therapy. And so um, it, it could be something as uh, simple as teaching a hand washing routine. It could be as complex as teaching um, complex social skills. Um, we teach language acquisition skill acquisition and behavior reduction. And we use a lot of different tools and a lot of different methods to kind of get us there, but it's all based on science. It's all based on what we can see, what we can observe, and we take data. And I think that's really what sets us apart from um, other, possibly other you know, branches of, of uh, psychology is that we take data on everything we do to show that we're making progress in skill acquisition and behavior reduction. Right. So, you know, you might not think about it, but 
I mean, children are expected to conform, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of ways that, well, that's what kids do, but, but some kids don't. For example, when kids go to kindergarten, they're all supposed to sit in a circle and the teacher's going to read to them or sing a song and everybody sit there and then they're all going to clap their hands. But some kids don't want to sit in the circle. It's like, that's not interesting. So mm -hmm. say you have a kid like that, right? He seems to be a regular kid. Um, somebody somewhere said, well, he's got autistic traits or he's on the spectrum or something. It all seems a little vague, but this kid does not want to sit in the circle. I mean, he'll sit every now and then he'll sit, but you know, then he's wandering off. So how would you apply ABA strategy to, to that? So first I would look at the social significance of it. Is it really that important that he's sitting in the circle with his peers or can we provide accommodations? Um, I think it's really important to listen to individuals with disabilities and see, you know, from their perspective, it's why should I conform? And is it really that important for me to conform? And so that's really the, the first step for me as a behavior analyst is I look at how important is it? Um, certainly there are some things that are very important. Like you can't punch somebody when you're angry with them, right? You can't, you can't can't um, punch yourself, you know, if you're frustrated, right? And so there are some things that, um, you know, are very socially significant, but that's the first step. So I would look at that. If it is very socially significant to sit in this circle, and sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do, um, I would look at what is reinforcing to that individual. So behavior analysis and ABA is really looking at positive reinforcement first. Um, and so I know that we have, you know, certainly we have history and there have been experiences that individuals have experienced punishment and a lot of punishment, but our field and our code of ethics really is based on positive reinforcement, utilizing positive reinforcement whenever we can. And so I would look at what is reinforcing to that individual. Um, does this, how can we set up the environment where you sit on the rug and then you get access to your favorite toy right after that, or uh, you get access to your favorite activity right after that. And sometimes these simple uh, shifts in the child's environment can facilitate that very meaningful behavior change. And so that's really the 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 bread and butter of a behavior analyst is we're looking at the environment. We're looking at what is motivating to the individual and we're looking at how can we um, kind of help nudge them into uh, engaging in a certain behavior that that we want them to engage in in order to access that reinforcement. All right. Well, let, let's push this a little further. You mentioned, for example, a child who his health. How do you so we were just talking about a behavior that we want to encourage, sit in the circle, mm -hmm. and you could see how you might apply a reward. But but what do you do if a kid is always, you know, climbing on the counter top, you know, in the kitchen and he's trying, you know, he loves to get the glasses and everything. And as soon as you turn your back, the kid's climbing on the countertop. Now, there's no reward you can give him because he's already up there. And how do you prevent him and sort of encourage him that, well, this is not socially acceptable behavior. This is not something that you can do. So I look at what what would I rather, right? What would I rather he engage in? So, or she engage in, right? And so um, if climbing is reinforcing, then I'm gonna bring him to a park and get it out there, right? I'm gonna try to replace that behavior with something that is more socially appropriate. Climbing is certainly something that many kids do with and without autism, right? And so what do we do? We bring them to parks, we bring them and show them here's an appropriate place. And so redirecting over and over and over again to the appropriate place and then reinforcing, I love that you climbed, you know, on the play structure rather than the counter. That's awesome. Um, and so reinforcing that over and over again, um, I would also look at toleration. And so um, sometimes individuals with autism and not, not only just kids with, with autism, but um, children in general struggle with toleration, tolerating no, tolerating that something is not a choice. And so um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Greg Hanley has a really fantastic, um, it's called skills-based treatment, and it basically looks at tolerating and increasing toleration of things that, um, you know, d disappointment, basically. Tolerating disappointment, tolerating no, tolerating sitting in line for two hours, um, all of the things that, you know, are inconvenient without engaging in challenging behavior. So we do have behavior analysts in the field that have kind of creating created some methods to help individuals tolerate um, when something is not available as well. 
Hmm. Give an example, please. <laughs> sure. Okay. So I had, uh, let's, let's say I have a client that every time uh, the iPad is not available, um, because it needs to be charged. He might throw the iPad or hit himself or hit his mom um, or throw himself on the floor and cry and scream uncontrollably. Um, and so what we would do is we would have a fully charged iPad and basically practice relinquishing the iPad over and over and over again and give it right back. And so kind of putting the power in his hands, in the child's hands, and, and kind of this is a safe space. We're just practicing. We're practicing giving something up, staying calm, engaging in some emotional regulation, practicing some coping skills, and then we're going to give the iPad right back to you. And so then we delay it a little bit. Now I'm going to wait 10 seconds before I give you back the iPad. Now 20 seconds, now 30 seconds. And I can do that for hours on end. Um, and so kind of this more systematic approach to tolerating disappointment, tolerating no, tolerating, um, you know, when things don't go your way and engaging in more appropriate coping skills. So I, I really like that. Um, that methodology that Dr. Hanley created because it is very slow and systematic and it's not like a band-aid that's ripped off where the iPad's available and now it's not and it just is what it is. It's this gradual toleration process that we're able to teach. You mentioned an aversion to uh, punishment uh, as part of this kind of concept of ABA uh, therapy. Um, and, uh, you know, these days, uh, it's it's not approved of in general to to uh, strike a child or you know whip them or put them in the uh, woodshed right those are kind of old fashioned uh, concepts although uh, some will say they were used for many years with uh, good success um, would you say that uh, so are are children with autism do they do they not get it in other words if you were to punish a child say by slapping his hand when he reached for something that he's not supposed to which i'm not endorsing but let's just say you did that are children with autism do they are they less responsive to that kind of discipline no i think it's just as devastating you know for individuals with what i've experienced it's, it's just as devastating for individuals with autism um i think what happens is in um not knowing what to do, people jump to punishment because they don't understand autism. Um, and so they might jump to punishment much more quickly because they're like, well, well, what works? Parents, right? Parents are, well, what works, right? I've had, I've worked with families that say, well, I, I had to spank him or I had to, you know, slap his hand because he he wasn't getting it. He wasn't hearing my words. He wasn't understanding my communication. Um, and so it's part of my job to go in and teach them how to teach the the behavior, right? They want to teach that you can't pull your sister's hair. You know, we can teach that without without spanking them. We can teach that them, you know, without putting them in their room and shutting the door. Um, and so I think it's more so about understanding um, autism and understanding the the ways in which they learn, individuals with autism learn best. Um, that's really kind of what we look at. Um, rather than look at punishment. It's not about that they don't get it. They they definitely do understand that. They have the same emotional responses of, you know, crying and, and feeling angry with themselves or uh, feeling shame. Um, the, the same things that we see with neurotypical individuals, for sure. Hmm. So it sounds like um, repetition is key, right? Yes. The, yes, repetition. Yes. And it sounds uh, fairly labor intensive. In other words, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. That's really, again, what sets us apart um, from many other therapies. You know, when you look at, um, if, if I were to go to a physical therapist, I'm probably going once a week for an hour. Um, and, and that's, that's and then I, I'm expected to do those exercises at home, um, you know, maybe every day, three times a day, something like that. Individuals uh, that are receiving ABA services are often receiving 20 to 40 hours of direct services per week. Um, and that doesn't even include the, the BCBAs that are working with the family, doing caregiver training, doing parent training, um, and uh, caregiver empowerment to help them to 
implement what we're doing in therapy at home when we're not there. Um, and so it is a very labor intensive process. We have what we call RBTs, registered behavior technicians. And these are people that have certifications. Um, they have uh, at least a you know, high school diploma um, or a GED. Uh, they take a course. We do a lot of training in-house. We have a really excellent, we call it the ABA Academy of Excellence. Um, and it's a, our training academy within our organization to train our direct service staff and to train the BCBAs who work for our organization to better work with the clients that we serve and their families as well. So it is very, very labor intensive. And, and that's something that um, you know, typically when I start working with families, I say, you know, my job is to put myself out of a job. I know you don't want us in your home forever. Um, I know you don't want us in your home for 40 hours a week for the rest of time. And so let's work really hard together. I'm going to teach you everything I know. We're going to work together um, and we're going to kind of get ourselves to a point where everybody feels comfortable. The client themselves has has mastered the goals um, that we put forth and um, we can kind of part ways and they can continue to implement what we've taught them during that period. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, the kids may or may not be in school or a special school for most of the day where presumably they're getting some of these therapies, hopefully, right? Aren't, aren't, are any of these ABA therapies provided in schools? Depends on the school. Um, certainly I have some clients that are placed at specialized ABA schools where they do receive that one-to-one. -one. I have some clients that receive um, that receive maybe one or two hours of ABA a day. Um, and then I have other clients that don't receive any type of ABA services. The school situation is a little bit tricky. Um, there are, Massachusetts has, has some great um, schools, great resources. Um, some other states might not have as great of resources, like New Hampshire, we service New Hampshire. So not all of the public schools offer access to a behavior analyst, access to RBTs, people that are qualified. And so that is a little bit tricky. They're, they're not always receiving ABA. They might be receiving OT, SLP, PT services in schools, but not always ABA. What is SLP? Oh, sorry. Speech services, uh, speech language pathologist. Speech language, but and you mentioned OT occupational yes, therapy. Yes, occupational therapy and then physical therapy. Yep. Well, it it sounds like the ones that really need to understand this are the uh, parents. How how do parents learn how to do ABA therapy? So thankfully, with we're, we are insurance funded, we are an insurance funded provider. And so the insurance company pays for us to go and actually do uh, family and caregiver training. And so it, it's something that we actually are encouraged to do and get paid for is to go out and work directly with the families and with their child to teach them how to implement a lot of the things that we're doing in therapy. And so the way that looks is, let's say I have a client that's receiving 30 hours of services, RBT services a week. Um, they're receiving, you know, they have an RBT in their home six or seven days a week. Um, I, as the BCBA, would go out for possibly three to six hours sitting with the parent and having them switch in and coaching them on working with their child and teaching them to do what the RBT is doing. Um, and so it's something that we, um, that that's recognized as, as really beneficial um, by not only, you know, research, it shows that that leads to better outcomes, but also the insurance companies also see that and they see how beneficial that is. And so they, they do allow for us to go in and do that. So we are, we are very fortunate in that we do that. And again, our company really pushes that and emphasizes that. Um, it's something that we have standards for all of our BCBAs right now in the field, what we're seeing is there are so many clients that need help and BCBAs are overloading themselves or getting overloaded with so many clients that they can't really give the parents the attention that they deserve. Um, and so what we do is we have a smaller number of clients um, that BCBAs manage so that they can really give the time and attention to the parents that they deserve um, and, and that they are able to go out and support them and um, help them work with their child. So that's something that I'm very proud of within our organization. Yeah, that sounds uh, terrific. Well, I can imagine that this kind of therapy is physically, you know, if you're dealing with a small child or an adolescent, it's going to be very emotionally and physically demanding uh, to the caregiver. 
uh, you know, you're not just uh, explaining something and then it's like, okay, it's like, there's a lot of repetition and a lot of, uh, well, yeah, incremental gains probably. In other words, it, it doesn't get fixed overnight. So you're struggling. Um, so you mentioned New Hampshire. Is, is your company uh, nationwide or does it work in New Hampshire? How does that work? Yeah, so we have clients that we're currently serving in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Florida. We are uh, in one month going to be opening in the Philadelphia area. We just um, actually donated a million dollars to Temple University. We are starting an autism lab with Temple University, and so we will be in the um, the Philadelphia area, and then we will be moving into New Jersey, uh, Cherry Hill area early next year as well. So we are a multi-state and we're continuing to expand with plans to go up and down the East Coast. And from what I hear, the CEO is also possibly exploring Texas as well. So I guess you need state licenses. It's a state regulated therapy Depends on the state. What's interesting is, you know, ABA in terms of regulation is so new um, that I, I think that the latest numbers are 30 something states have state licenses. Um, in New Hampshire, there is not yet a state licensed for for behavior analysts, but in Massachusetts, there is. Um, if Florida does not have a state license. So I have a state license in Pennsylvania. I have a state license in Massachusetts, um, but I do not have a state license in uh, New Hampshire and Florida because we don't have it. So every uh, state really is different at this point. There is a national license, the, BC the BCBA certification, um, and that is through the BACB. Um, that is uh, what, what we all have, but then every state does something different. You mentioned outcomes. I mean, <laughs> I, I think every parent who has a, a child who's been diagnosed with autism wants to see their, you know, child be like a, a regular kid, right? A, a typical, typical kid, be able to sit in the circle and play sports and follow directions and uh, have uh, positive behaviors, right? Not negative behaviors. So I, I, in how, what happens to kids with autism? You know, say a kid's four years old and diagnosed with autism. Are they, are they going to become a typical child when they're a teenager or not? Or how do they know? Or how does the therapy influence that? You know, I think what's interesting is we've kind of, we're starting as a field to move away from this idea of getting them to become typical, getting them to become, you know, uh, status quo, right? Um, and leaning more towards what the disability advocates kind of, we're listening to people with autism and we're listening to disability advocates and we're trying to look at, let's celebrate the differences. Let's celebrate the differences and the diversity that we have with individuals with autism. And so um, what, what I try to do is I try to help families reframe what success is. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I have a family that comes and I'm like, well, what do you want for your child? I want them to be happy. Well, they don't need to be, uh, you know, sit in a circle and, and act, you know, the same as all of their peers, right? They don't need to do that in order to be happy, right? Um, and so we look at that and we also look at, um, you know, what is socially significant to the family and we celebrate every little success. I have one family, um, I've had a family that there, when, when we sat down and started, what's your goal for your child? I want them to sit at the dinner table with us and eat dinner. Okay. And that's what we worked on. And they were able to sit at the dinner table by the end of, you know, a couple months and eat dinner with their family um, and then go off and do what they really wanted to do, but still engage and do what other people wanted to do for a little bit and tolerate that, you know, without, without hurting themselves or somebody else. And so I think kind of to answer your question, we're reframing it. We're looking at it differently. Um, I have individuals in my life that are very close to us. Um, you know, my my husband and I have a friend. Uh, we we had a COVID wedding, um, so we didn't actually have a wedding. But he was supposed to. Our friend was supposed to be in our wedding, and he has autism, and he went through specialized schooling, and um, you know, he he has struggled with with getting and holding jobs. Um, but he has a girlfriend and he has a good life and he can su support himself and he needs a little bit of extra support sometimes, but in general, he's happy. Um, and so uh, does it look like somebody that is 
climbing the corporate ladder and, you know, making a lot of money or anything like that. No, but that's okay. Um, and there are many individuals with autism that are doing that too. So I, I think it's really uh, reframing kind of what success is and helping families understand that their, their child is perfect just the way they are. Um, and here's how we can help them uh, live a live a happy life. Well, I think that's great, but I would also, I think it's a little bit of a cop-out. I mean, kids need to grow up and they need to be able to live independently and get a job, yeah. care for themselves. I mean, the parents aren't going to be there forever. And, yeah. uh, you know, that that's a real challenge. I mean, it's, it's nice to be, you know, happy and, uh, you know, jumping up and down, but uh, they have to be able to deal with the the real world. I think all parents would have that, you know, as, as a goal, although I agree with you that uh, perhaps our, you know, what our definition of success certainly needs to be individualized. And that, of course, for everyone depends on their own uh, potential. Uh, um, but sometimes I think with children with autism, their their potential is compromised by their behaviors. You know, they may be very smart and bright, and yet, you know, if they can't succeed in school, then they, they can't become engineers, even though they might have the the smarts to do it. If the behavior doesn't, you know, let them sit still, then uh, then they, they're really struggling. So is ABA yeah. appropriate for that kind of scenario? Absolutely. No, absolutely. You know, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right that, yes, they do have to uh, learn to live independently. They do have to learn, uh, need to learn how to ask for help and, and you know, um, brush their own teeth and things like that, or, or ask for help brushing their teeth or whatever, right? Um, so, the communication is really kind of what we focus on self-help. And I think it also depends on if the individual with autism has an accompanying um, intellectual disability as well, because that certainly impacts outcomes um, that, that it's slower to uh, maybe acquire skills and, and to decrease challenging behaviors and uh, the likelihood that they'll be able to live independently, um, you know, with without, you know, it being a group home or some type of support, things like that. So I think that is, autism is such a wide spectrum, so it is kind of hard to say. Um, but what I've seen over and over again is individuals with autism um, with support and with intensive therapies have been able to kind of change the trajectory and um, be able to uh, learn how to tolerate, learn how to take care of themselves and and um, kind of live, live in, in this society for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, that's what uh, you live for, right? That's that's the whole idea is to help each child achieve their their potential. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's really what we're here to do. Well, this has been a great discussion. Is there anything else you'd like to add or tell us about uh, ABA therapy or your uh, organization there? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think our organization is is very special in the way that we are so client focused and we really go above and beyond over and over again. We talk about being, this is a silly analogy, but uh, being the best cheeseburger. And there's a whole story to that, that our CEO, you know, goes on about, but we're the, we're the best cheeseburger. Um, and so we have these, what we call a best cheeseburger moments. And so we talk about the things that are, um, that we're very proud of within the organization. And we start every meeting with something that we're proud of within, within our company. And so I, I hear stories of people, you know, there's a family that said, hey, we really struggled going to Target. So the therapist will go out to Target with them every single day that week to practice just with the child going to Target, right? Um, I have some families last year, an amazing, you know, we had uh, a family that said, hey, we're nervous about Christmas. And so one of our RBTs went out and helped the families open presents on Christmas and helped the child, you know, open presents and um, share, you know, with their sibling, you know, without any fighting and things like that. And so I, I would say that the focus on being client centered um, is really, really important. If you're somebody that's searching out for ABA therapy and you're searching out for a therapist, you're searching out for um, support, looking at, does the company have that as a value um, where we're client, where they're client centered? Are they going to meet us where we're at? Or are they going to force us into the hours that they want us to do and the place that they want us to do it in a clinic or something like that? And so um, we have in-home services, we have clinic services, we have community services, we go into schools, 
Um, we really meet people where they're at. So I, I, I would say that that really sets us apart. And um, that's what I would encourage families to do is really interview the people that you're, uh, that you are uh, bringing into your home and you're bringing into your child's life and make sure that your values align. Um, other than that, you know, if anybody has any questions or uh, has any uh, interest in services, uh, ABA Centers of America um, is our company. Uh, my email is, you know, esantigati at uh, avacenters.com. Um, and we have an incredible admissions team that works 24 seven that will pick up the phone when you call, which I absolutely love because that's something that's pretty unique about our company as well. So um, we are here to help you. Emily, I want to thank you very much. And I'll put that uh, information uh in the show notes. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining me on The Art of Medicine. Thank you so much. Before we close, I'd like to give another thanks to our sponsor, locumstory.com, a resource where providers can get real unbiased answers about locum tenants. That's locumstory.com. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner. See you next time. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com.